Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 236, featuring the fourth installment of my interview with Miss Brenda Romero. This part of the interview, we focus in on a topic that's very near and dear, very close to uh, Brenda's heart, namely sexism in the gaming industry. How bad is it? Uh, has it gotten better or worse over time? And what we as gamers or as developers can do about it? A lot of great stuff in this episode. So without further ado, here is Miss Brenda Romero. That's a great segue into this question from uh, GoTrek, and I had a couple people write in about this, maybe a, <laughs> a half a dozen or so. So they're wanting to get your thoughts on the female character stereotypes in games, and I found a really fun quote from you. Where were you talking, I think it was Baldur's Gate, Dark Alliance, the box, and <laughs> said, look, we have these two guys dressed head to toe in leather, and the woman looks like she's on her way to a stripping engagement. <laughs> yeah, she's I mean, not. I mean, that seems to have persisted for so long. Uh, and you, you know, I think you're, you know, you say you think that's probably why a lot of female gamers are, are turned away uh, from gaming. Do you see that going away, or is it still with us, or, or what? Well, I mean, of course it's still with us, right? You know, I, um, yeah, man, it's still with us, and it's ridiculous because I know that in the event of, uh, you know, if <laughs> there's no way, like I can't imagine in my personal life, John, John grabbing a, you know, a, a plate mail, um, a plate mail suit of armor. And I'm going to say, I'm going to like grab a plate mail bikini, like for what, right? Like it's crazy. And, and I think it's, it's almost become this expected thing, right? But if you've never played games before, so when I play a game, it sort of doesn't surprise me to see that because it's almost what I expect to see unfortunately um but but if you are just new to video games like imagine if you are one of those people who you come in through casual games and now you want to try some video games and this is what you get to play i mean and it's it's not just it's not just women that have these stereotypical characters it's also it's also characters that are not white um, you know, like uh, I remember my son, so my son is, uh, you know, I have, I have kids that are, are you know, basically the full range of the color brown. Um, and, uh, you know, from uh, Donovan, who's, who's darker, to Avalon, who's lighter skinned than me. And I remember Donovan saying to me, why can't I create, create myself in a game? He just wanted to see himself in a game. Like he wanted to be a dark character, but did he really, was his choice really only Af uh, an Afro uh, or cornrows, like really, that was it. That was that's all he got. Um, and uh, it, although you know, it's kind of funny because it's it's interesting to think like, well, like at least that was you know, holy shit, it took us twenty years to get that in a game, right? And it's just it's just fucking crazy that that happens. Um, I do feel that it's that the ground soil is starting to change though. But but let me tell you about a couple problems that I, that I encountered this summer. So after my <laughs> No, I've got a term for it. After my rage from the stage, um, you know, where I where I basically said, like, I want to bring me be able to bring my daughter to E3 and not have her feel like she's leered at. Um, after you know, and, and a lot of women after the whole number one reason why and the whole number one reason to be movement, you know, people just talking about this has got to stop and here are the problems and and you know, hundreds of women speaking out. Um, you know, that creates not just these little drops, but a way that, that you can't deny is is that you can't deny um and so people um i i heard i would when we were traveling this summer we went to a ton of different places and i would hear people tell me like say things like you know listen i talked to my art director and i said that this stuff makes me uncomfortable and it wasn't just women talking to me either this stuff makes me uncomfortable and my art director said well this is what we have to do and just ignored it like they they refuse to do that. So there are there are people, and I, it's not once that I heard that either. There are people speaking out, and and as yet they are unable to affect change. But I know change is occurring because I also hear about those things, and I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing much better portrayals of women in games, um, of female characters in games, and just of 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 characters that are um of characters that are well we'll say basically everybody but straight white guys um with you know i'm with not that i have anything against straight white guys but we're seeing games become more 
diverse. And, uh, you know, a lot of this is, a lot of this is coming from uh, the twine movement, you know, games like Anna Antropy's Dysphoria and the recognition that those games are getting, you know, Maddie Bryce's Minichi. Um, so there's a lot of games coming out that are, that are, that are pushing those boundaries. Um, and it needs to keep happening. Uh, you know, and I, you know, to me, it just looks ridiculous. Like I see some of those ads and I just think like, oh, for, you know, for f- sake, like seriously, really? <laughs> so you're, you're seeing just as many of these booth babes and all that kind of nonsense at uh, these conventions even today? Hasn't nope. died down? Uh, last year it was down. Yeah, last year it was down. The year that, the, the last year that I went, uh, the year that I went to E3 when it had sort of hit a fever pitch again, um, it's, it, you know, it's interesting because I think it, it becomes this, um, it, it becomes a very polarizing issue, right? This is where, this is where I, you know, it just, it pisses a lot of people off, right? Um, uh, when people go to these conferences and it's interesting, like, so just like to give you my perspective, like just imagine if you're walking through a conference, like, you know, was, like the first day I went, I went as normal me, right? Which is pretty much what you're looking at now. Um, so I went as normal me and t-shirt jeans. And then the next day, uh, you know, I, I go and um, I feel uncomfortable because I feel like I'm getting leered at. And if you've ever been, if you've ever walked by a construction site, you'll know what I mean. And it's, it's people looking at you in, in a way that just makes you feel kind of uncomfortable or, or you feel kind of uncomfortable, like you feel kind of uncomfortable, um, you know, like I talked way earlier on when you asked me the question, like, well, but it's not Hustler or Penthouse, which tells me, which is fine, right? Like that you actually have looked at the range. So you know the difference between Hustler and Penthouse and Playboy. And you know that in fact, beyond Hustler and Penthouse, there's more, right? So you like know this range. But for many people, they're not even they're not even on the Playboy side, right? They they don't even they don't even they've never even been that far. So so walking into a conference where you're standing next to to a woman who who is being treated as a form of ornamentation, right? Whose whose goal is to be a display object, where where women's bodies, the purposes that they're using women's bodies as a platform for advertisement, how about you, right? How about there's there's a lot more to that, and then, and then when so, and then when when people are in this in this situation, like as if there's no other option, right? Like I understand why they do it from a marketing perspective. Hey you, hey you geek, would you like your picture with stunning, beautiful woman? Awesome, you take it, you put it out on Twitter, a hundred people see it. Yes, job done. Like I get that, but I also get that it's not f- acceptable, right? Like and and. In that it's not okay. This is a place of business. And if this is a place of business, it's a place where I go to, to conduct contracts. And, um, you know, in, in fact, one of the things that I'll be talking about at, at the rant at GDC this year is I'll be talking about the worst experience I ever had at a game conference, um, which I'm sure in some part had to do with this, with this, uh, with this atmosphere, which, and I've talked to a ton of guys about this and, um, and it's, it's just a really awkward place to go into. It's really like I walk by, it, it's a really awkward place for people to go into for men and women. And this wouldn't be treated and it treated, it wouldn't be acceptable in, in any other job site except the f- strip club, right? Um, but yet we, we, when I was talking about a contract, literally next to me, and I, and I mean, like, okay, make sure my, like the dude next to me who if I had just leaned, I would have hit his shoulder. He's talking about this woman's tits and ass and, and nobody's, nobody's acknowledging it, but it's, but it's awkward. <laughs> like it's, why is that okay? Like, could we move past that please? And I've, you know, I've heard people say things like, well, you know, at least it's, it's not like, uh, it's not like car shows. And you know, actually I've got a classic car and car shows are way better. Car shows, like the classic car shows are, are, have moved way beyond where the game industry last was. Um, you know, and I, and, and, and I, so, you know, to me, um, that's, it, it doesn't matter. Like it's a professional environment. You know, I, I went to BlizzCon this year. I didn't feel, I didn't feel whacked at BlizzCon. I went to IndieCade this year, loved IndieCade. I go to GDC, um, 
you know, I, I, I think if, if we really want women to feel comfortable in games and we want to increase our, our player base, that making women not feel uncomfortable when they first get into video games. And there's 500 million people who basically got educated in casual games and can move into the core space. Making them come into the core space and not feel like, why do I have to walk around in lingerie? Uh, I think that's super important. Um, one of my uh, colleagues, Sherry Grainer Ray, she wrote this book called Gender Inclusive Game Design, which I think is a must street for game designers. Um, and one of the things that she points out when she gives lectures on this, on, on her book and on her work, and she has this slide that shows um, uh, men in uh, the, the Calvin Klein underwear model. And he's you know, posed very suggestively. And you know, I sort of riffed off that in my GDC talk, uh, number one reason to be last year, where I showed like this one slide after another of really hot guys, and I let them linger there. And, and it's awkward, right? Like it's, it's not awkward for any of the women in the audience and they're loving it. And like, why should this bother you? Um, and, and that's kind of how, how your average woman feels when we go to E3. You know, we're, we're there to do business. Um, and it's not a question that people are like, you know, I've heard some criticisms leveled at women like, oh, you, know, you need to get better self-esteem. And I got my self-esteem is fine. I'm all right with who I am. Um, and I like who I am. It has nothing to do with that. It's just, you know, maybe I don't, I don't want to talk about contracts while talking about tits and ass. And I think that's, I think that's not an unreasonable request, you know, and I think it's also not an unreasonable request that, that companies in the game industry stop treating women and women's bodies um, as, and just as, as vehicles for advertising. That's not okay. What about just gamers, you know, folks watching the show that are bothered by this too? Maybe they're not actually part of the games industry themselves. Is there anything they can do uh, about this? Is there anything they can do about this? Um, you know, I, I guess if, I guess if they see it, I mean, a lot of this, a lot of the reason why it works is because it, is because it's just, you know, it's, it's fun to, it's, you know, I, I'm. I, I'm sort of struggling for like, geez, what can you do? What what could what could the average gamer do about this? You know, I guess I guess the average gamer could say like they if 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 they play female characters and, and a lot of guys do play female characters, you know, to to maybe want to <laughs> to want to have some some actual armor uh, on your character. Um, you know, player feedback is really important to game developers, and it's easier to get that feedback now more than ever. Um, I think too. Uh, you know, there, there were people who were, um, who were calling companies to task, who were having these, uh, you know, booth babe shows. And man, it's, it's nothing compared to, granted, thank goodness, it is nothing compared to what it was at its peak. Um, you know, and like I go back, you know, this is where normally people, um, you know, people through the magic of Google, they discover that I worked on a Playboy project and they say like, you know, Jesus, you f hypocrite, how can you have these opinions on these things? And have I have done that? Well, you know, like I said, I, it's not something that I would do um, if I had the choice to do it. Do I regret it? Yeah, for that that I that I glorified objectifying women. That I, well, I mean, I didn't invent Playboy, um, uh, but that I took part, um, you know, in promoting an IP that did that. Yeah, man, you know that. I don't think that was a cool thing to do, and and, and it's not the same decision that I would make. Um, now I forgot the original question because that, you know, that's obviously not something that weighs lightly on my mind. Oh, wait, what can gamers do, right? Yeah, is there, a, I don't know, a petition somewhere or maybe not, just not buy certain games from certain companies? I mean, what? So yeah. I, I like your idea about the avatar, so just choose the, an appropriate avatar. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, it's, it's been in part... Um, you, you know, so like one of a, a pretty fascinating thing that happened for me is, uh, you know, the story of Manichi where Maddie Bryce, in order to, in order to have a, a character like her in a video game, she had to make a video game. Like, you know, what kind of statement is that? I don't know of any game developer who knows about that who wasn't moved by it. Um, you know, likewise, uh, you know, games like, um, you know, and I've already mentioned Anna Entropy's Dysphoria, same sort of thing, you know, where, where 
she, her, you know, in, in Dysphoria is a super short game. It's 10 minutes. There's zero reason that anybody has not to have played this game. Um, you know, and, and this is, you know, part of the story of, of her life. So people making these games, I wouldn't necessarily just assume because you're a player, you can't, you can't shape the experience that games create. Um, because you can, you know, these are, you know, these are two people, um, you know, every game developer at some point in time was a player and, and they, they that's transitioned over and started making their own experiences. I don't think, you know, I don't think boycotts or petitions. I don't, I don't think that, that so much matters, but what I do think is, um, you know, like, you know, I've mentioned, uh, I went, mentioned that I was horrifically pregnant with twins. I swear to God, this is going to be related in a second. <laughs> Being horrifically pregnant with twins means that I am a mother. And as a mother, there are a couple ways that I can parent. One of which is fear. And if you screw up, you are going to be punished. And I don't parent that way. Uh, although if the kids do screw up and they screw up significantly enough, they will be punished. But you know, that's not my leading choice by any stretch of the imagination. My leading choice is to just applaud the behavior that they do well. So uh, if they do something, if they do something great, um, you know, like uh, Mesa is, uh, you know, headed toward honor roll. Um, Lilia, our 15 year old is all straight A's, not just straight A's, she's straight A pluses right now. Um, and so rewarding that, applauding that behavior when they do something good, um, you know, give them positive feedback. It's the same thing that we do in games, right? You know, you do well and you get, you get rewarded. You do well and, you know, um, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I'm thinking special finishing move, but that's totally the wrong thing for parenting, right? <laughs> um, but, but when you see something, that's great. When you see something that is what you want, Applaud that. Let the developer know that you liked it. Um, developers are super accessible now on Twitter. I mean, you know, and, and and developers are very responsive on Twitter, generally, I find. So when you see somebody making something that you like, um, applaud that. Tell them that you like that. If there's something that you wish a game could see, ask for it. Um, I, you know, I find like the, you know, just the waves of criticism and, um, you know, and I even think that's, you know, in part why, why, uh, why, after number one reason why, um, number one reason to be, why, why that whole hashtag and movement started was just like, well, wait, well, let's talk about some of the positive stuff. Because people are much more likely to do something if, if they feel that it's something that people will appreciate. And honestly, you know, sometimes I just think people don't think about the ways that games can change, that it might not occur to them. Like the game that I'm working on right now, uh, as of this morning, so not my non-digital game, but a digital game that I'm working on, as of this morning, there's actually not a white character in the game. Um, I, uh, the, the lead artist, the current guy is doing concepts. And when I looked at all the concepts, he, you know, I had said to him, like, I want to see, I want it, I want you to think of people and I want you to ask yourself, do they see themselves in that game? Um, and, you know, and likewise, when I work with conferences, like think of who's in your audience and do they see themselves in your speakers? Like, because I, that is so important. I, I get, you know, still get Facebook messages and emails from young women who, who write to me for, for two reasons. One, because I'm a woman in games, and two, I failed to die yet, so I've been around for a long time, right? And based on those two things, no work, nothing that I've ever done, just like you make games, you're of three things. You make games, you're a woman, and you're, and you're not dead yet. That somehow, because you just keep doing these things, you can be a role model in games. And I know that when we go to Mexico, uh, because John is Mexican, um, he's a huge role model to people there. And you know, when John comes from a super poor family, um, you know, and he's, his, his family and his father died of alcoholism. I mean, he's, he's, he's got a pretty rough story. And, um, but nonetheless, you know, he's like, John has spoken at a lot of schools, uh, you know, for disadvantaged youth and at-risk kids and people just, they just want something to point at. And, and I, and I, and I feel it's important that they have that in, in not just in, in developers, but they have that in a game. Um, and so, 
when you know as a for instance when i was working on wizardry 8 i remember i was i was in barbados for part of it living there for part of it and i remember this guy come up coming up behind me um antonio and he says to me brenda how come there's no black characters in video games and my initial response was what like that's, that's ridiculous of course and i couldn't think of one i actually could not think of a black character in a video game and man, is that, that like how many levels of wrong is that? Um, people tend to make, the, you know, they tend to they tend to create in their own image, right? Um, and so therefore, or they tend to create in the image that they want to see. And so our early game industry is largely a bunch of white guys. And so it's not a surprise that the games reflect that. In fact, you know, it wasn't until Leather Goddess of Phobos that you could actually be a female in a game. You can actually choose your gender. I mean, in, in Wizardry, I, I assumed some of my characters were women, but there was not actually an explicit gender choice. So some of those things just haven't occurred to us. Like, I guess now everybody takes for granted that, that you, you can play as a male or female character, or if the game is appropriate, that you can actually choose your gender. Um, so it's, and, and when those changes happened, they were applauded. And so they were just added to the list of things you need to do when you're designing a game. And I likewise think that uh, applauding developers who take those steps, you know, like, you know, for instance, uh, Dysphoria, you know, got a um, number of nods in the IGF last year. And well, it should. And a lot of game developers talk about it. And so when people take these, um, when when people take these steps to push the boundaries of game design and to push the to to tell their story through game mechanics when people do that it's incredibly powerful and it sends a message to other people that okay the boundaries the the people space that that games occupy has has gone out further um, and you know what i feel uh, going back to an original point of this i feel that that message got to e3 last year like they're like E three felt like a much more normal place to walk around. You know, there weren't there weren't women there weren't women leaving because they felt uncomfortable, and that had happened the year before. And it wasn't just me who did that. And and in fact, I, I heard from a lot of guys too. Um, I didn't hear from any guys who left because they felt uncomfortable. Although that may be the case, but but I certainly heard from a lot of women who were like, you know, this. I'm, I'm you know, I was originally going to meet with somebody there, but we're we're just going to meet for dinner off site. And if that's just not fair, but man, I, you know, I, I've, <laughs> I've said it for over 30 years, I feel like, but you know, we're still changing, you know, and hopefully it'll keep getting better. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a fifth and final installment of this interview with Ms. Brenda Romero. A lot of great stuff coming up. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I've got enough footage for a whole segment, so I might uh, tie it in with a retrospective or do a little bonus episode of whatever it is, guys. Just stay tuned. I'm sure you will enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much if you have supported me and Matt Chat. If you'd like to support the show, just go to the Patreon site. It's in the show notes. You can uh, sign up for any dollar amount you want. That will also get you access to a members-only video a podcast thing on Google Air Hangouts. You can actually uh, participate in those too, live. We're doing them every Friday, first Friday of every month at uh, 5 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. So if you'd like to participate in that, be part of the show, or just watch it live, uh, just follow the links in the show notes and set up your Patreon site. I'll also keep you uh, updated on that Patreon site about the upcoming uh, Google Air Match Hat Extended Productions. <laughs> Gotta come up with a better name. Let me know if you come up with one. All right, what about that ale of the week? Maybe this will help. Oh, this week I've got something really awesome. A St. Vrain Triple L. This is from the Left Hand Brewing Company. And they are out of Longmont, Colorado. Let's see if it says anything about the brew here. Oh, here we go. Brewed on the banks of the mighty St. Vrain. I'm guessing that's a river. Yes. <laughs> the usually peaceful St. Vrain River snakes out of the Rocky Mountains, winding mischievously towards our brewery. Named after Saren St. Vrain, an 1800s trapper and trader in the valley. Okay, version of a classic Belgian triple. That sounds really good. 
Light in color, lightly hopped, uh, Celia hops, touch of malt, uh, blah, blah, blah. Alcohol, 9.3% by volume. So that's right on up there. Better drink this slowly. And enjoy it 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit in a goblet. Well, I hope the rather excellent drinking horn is up to the task. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this St. Vrain's here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this. It definitely smells like a triple. If you haven't ever had one of these, it's kind of a very fruity, peachy kind of aroma. Uh, it's definitely very distinctive. Once you've had a few, you'll learn to appreciate that. Uh, this definitely, the aroma is right on the money. Uh, let's give it a taste, though. Wow, that is really potent flavor here. I'm getting a lot of that uh, triple flavor. Uh, let's see what, what kind of uh, flavors do we have here. A lot of peaches, a lot of citrus, almost kind of an orangey uh, flavor to this. Very sweet, uh, very aromatic. Uh, just really, really wonderful taste on this. Let me give it a, another try. Yeah, very, really, really good stuff. A lot of peaches, uh, pretty much all of that triple flavor. It's almost like a concentrated triple. Uh, really intense flavor on this. And I'm just going to have to give it one more try. Yeah, just excellent stuff. Really a hell of a lot of flavor here. If you like uh, Belgian triples, you know, I don't see how you can go wrong with this one. A lot of peach, a lot of citrus, a lot of uh, very refreshing. Even though it has all that alcohol in it, you don't taste it at all. Uh, just really, really good stuff. No doubt about it. A full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, St. Vrain Left Hand Brewing Company. If you see one of these, I strongly suggest you pick it up immediately. I know you'll enjoy it. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. So I was looking for a good quotation about equality. To go with the theme of the show. And I found one from W. Edward Dimming. It really struck a nerve with me. To go with something like this. It is not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory. See you guys next week. Got to make a big decision. Where does your snow live? Let's say soon goes right. Let's go uphill now. Look at that. See? Oh, I know. You're saying, Bob, you made a mess this time. You may be right, too. I've certainly been known to do that. There we go. But we don't, we don't make mistakes, you know. We have happy accidents.